Okay. I'm just gonna... okay. Or Let's we'll see. put you as a co-host. Claudia, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you guys. You want to be a co-host? Sure. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's right. That'll work. Okay. Yeah, yeah, she can do that. And okay. then... Um... All right. Thanks, Claudia. So, Michael, I'm sorry about this. <laughs> No, it's, a, it's okay. And yeah, so we just tell her next slide. Okay. Um, all right. Let's start it here. I guess they might want to see the slides, so I can move this around. So if they want to see it, I'll flip through it if anybody here wants to. Okay. Okay. Let me put this on mute for a second. Okay, uh, Salaikum. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Shadi, can you hear me okay? Is everything good? It's great on our end. Okay, great. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is Tabrez Ibrahim. Uh, thanks for Muslim Space and everybody organizing to uh, coordinate this. So it's great to be here. Salaikum and uh, Ramadan Karim. Uh, today is March 25th. Uh, I'm here in my hometown of Austin, Texas. Hopefully, Everybody that's here can hear me, uh, whether on Zoom or in person. So uh, this is kicking off this uh, speaker series with Muslim Space. And I'll just uh, walk through some of my slides and present this uh, topic, which is titled Islamic Intellectual Property. And I'm going to guide uh, uh, Shadia on this in terms of I've got a lot of slides. So I'm just going to ask gently, nicely to go on to the next slide, please. So I'm um, on slide one. We'll go to slide two here. Okay, so I've got an outline here. Hopefully everyone can see. I'm just going to cover four main things in this time before uh, iftar and open it up for Q&A. So first, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, myself, who I am, and my motivations for this project. Uh, as shown on the earlier slide, I'm on the faculty at uh, Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland. Uh, that was one of the logos. And uh, the other logo was for um, George Mason University, where I have a research affiliation and that supported some of my travel for this project to various Muslim countries. And then second, oh, okay, sure. Let me move this around. Okay, great. Uh, second thing, I'm just gonna go over an overview of some of the key questions on this research project and my background, a uh, little bit on the background of this, and then um, go into um, third, uh, I'll go into uh, some of the frameworks I apply, and then fourth, uh, why, anyone who should care and um, what this is about and what some of the proposals are. So uh, that's my overview and great. Okay, so those are my uh, four uh, main points. Again, I'm Tabrez Ibrahim. Uh, I guess we're recording here, so hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, and this presentation is titled Islamic Intellectual Property. It's part of my research. Uh, the first slide prior to this had my affiliations. Uh, I'm on the faculty at uh, Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon and also with the research affiliation with um, George Mason University that, that funded my travel for this uh, project. Okay, uh, so next slide, please. One, two, slide three. Oh, okay, so great. Um, so we're on slide three and I've got like um, a roadmap so that everybody knows where I'm at. And so again, I'll start off first talking a little bit about myself and why this project um, is important to me, what my motivations are. Okay, next slide, please. So we're on slide four. There's some animation, so you may have to click through this. But um, I wanted to relate this uh, on slide four to the Muslim space vision and statement of principles in a way. So I have some uh, from the Muslim, Muslim space uh, vision here, some words from it directly from it. What stood out to me, as you may see, and it's a very well thought out um, 
vision and statement of principles. And you'll notice the recognition of pluralistic uh, space and pluralistic values. So looking at you know uh, a range of values and uh, it's a really well-written uh, and well thought out mission statement. And you'll see me and hear me talk a little bit about pluralism and how this applies to this particular uh, project. Um, next um, animation, please. Uh, on slide four. And also the Muslim space principles, again, very well thought out. I've jotted down a few of the key phrases from it pertaining to uh, the focus on pluralism and just manner. And uh, that'll inform a bit of my uh, talk. Okay, next slide five, please. So a little bit about my background, just to kind of set context. I know some of you others I uh, have just met. So uh, on the left is uh, the school that I'm employed at, Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland. Uh, there's a hyperlink to my faculty website. On the right side is an affiliation with um, George Mason University in DC. And uh, on the right side is mention of this research grant that I got to uh, make some uh, uh, you know, make a trip in this past uh, December 2022 to various countries. So I wanted to recognize George Mason for uh, supporting this project. Okay, next slide, uh, six. So a few more animations about this. On the left side, it's just kind of my motivation. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm here from Austin. This is my hometown. I've always been a bit of a curious person. And um, next animation, just sort of wanted to explore a lot about ideas and Islam. And I had a chance to practice law in Houston and uh, spent a good amount of time with the Islamic Dawa Center in downtown Houston. That also gave me a chance to uh, learn more in this field and uh, continuing in the animation. So now what I do is focus on knowledge. And as a professor, it's focused on um, you know, education and analysis and research and teaching. So that's a little bit about myself. On the right side, the next animation is a little bit more of my academic background. So I'm an alum from here at um, University of Texas at Austin. I studied mechanical engineering. I've always been interested in technology uh, through a sort of a roundabout path. I ended up at law school at Northwestern in Chicago. And there I took a class uh, in Islamic law by Professor Kristen Stilt. And uh, at UT also took an Islamic studies class. Uh, so I had some coursework. And then I ended up uh, many years later practicing law at a law firm, Bracewell in Houston. We ended up representing a lot of clients in the energy, oil, and gas chemicals world, which is very strong in the Arab Peninsula and Muslim countries. We had several Saudi clients, including um, Saudi Ramco, uh, Sabic, Kaust, KFUPM. These are organizations and institutions in Saudi Arabia. And it made me think a little bit about the intersection of uh, the practice I was in intellectual property and Islamic law, which is um, uh, the law in uh, Saudi Arabia, but broadly in that region as well. Uh, next animation. And now I'm focused as a professor on mostly patent law. I'll talk a little bit about that for those of you that are new to it and interested long-term in Islamic law and the intersections of it. So that's a, just a little bit of an overview about my background. I'll go on to the next slide, um, uh, seven. And I have some things I've written you can access. There's some hyperlinks. Uh, I've got a law review article that's on the left side on my uh, SSR, SSRN page off my faculty website. Um, got a post with a Patent Leo, which is a patent lawyer's website. And uh, that's in the middle. And on the right side, I have an article with NAML, that's the National Association of Muslim Lawyers. Uh, so I've gotten some works if you want to access. Um, they're in different lengths and degrees of depth. Okay, next slide. I'll get into more of the fun stuff too in a moment. If you're really interested in this field, uh, there is a recorded webinar that I have. Um, there's a link of this on slide eight, and it is a more practical oriented uh, webinar that I conducted actually with some of my former colleagues from my law firm and others um, that uh, was hosted by George Mason. And then next month at the end of April, um, George Mason University has a virtual um, free conference you can register for that talks about the intersection of religion and intellectual property. Uh, the panel I'll be on will have different faith perspectives, a Buddhist perspective, a Hindu perspective, and myself from an Islamic perspective and some others. So it's a really interesting talk if you're interested. 
Okay, next slide, uh, nine. Okay, so let me just kind of go through the key questions that I'm gonna, uh, that have motivated me that I'm interested in and will be the sort of foundations of this presentation. Number one is just a justification for what is intellectual property. I'll talk a little bit about what that is that may be foreign to a lot of people here and how it can be justified within Islamic law. So this is an overview on just um, sort of Islamic law in general I'll go into and then how it can be justified. So these are things I've been really focused on. The second uh, one, the next animation about comparative law. So how we compare what is the law here in the US to other legal institutions and other cultures. And so I'm interested in comparing the so-called Western vision that's in like the US and UK versus um, what would be an Islamic vision of intellectual property. Uh, next, um, I'm interested in connecting this theory to practice and applications in Muslim countries, how these concepts can be applied. And uh, fourth and finally, I'm also interested in um, ethics, uh, particularly Islamic ethics. Um, and this is primarily because I made some contacts and now colleagues in Jordan that are uh, in that country focused on Islamic bioethics with folks in pharmacy and medicine and scientists. So that's kind of the reason why I got interested in that. So these are some of the key questions I've been thinking about. One, about justifying um, uh, kind of topics in Islamic law. Two, comparing different legal systems. Three, uh, applying this theory in practice. And then four, looking at Islamic ethics. Okay, so I'll go on to the uh, next slide. Uh, 10, so now I'll talk about um, where I'm at is some of the key questions and some of the uh, background uh, that I want to cover. So first, let me just start off on the next slide, um, 11, on intellectual property. With this animation on the left, uh, it shows what we know here in Texas pretty well, um, ice tea. Let me ask, see if anybody here in the audience knows anything about intellectual property or may know what is the value of iced tea besides drinking it. I know this is Many people are fasting, so I'm trying not to tempt anyone, but we know this is pretty common in Texas. So where does the value of iced tea come in? What is so unique about iced tea, especially the Texans here that drink this all the time? What makes iced tea what it is? Any no thoughts on that? It's refreshing, yes. Yeah, so there's some sort of taste to it that's sort of unique also, I would assume. Well, let me, let me just walk through this. So what I wanna ask is what is intellectual property? And well, it exists even in iced tea. It's all around us. One is the sugars that go in iced tea. So the next animation shows these various chemical compounds that you can pretty much identify with. Uh, you have natural sugar, um, various artificial sweeteners. There's also, you may recognize the different packaging. Uh, sugar in the raw is this brown package. And then you have these other ones with different color and different artwork. So intellectual property is uh, reflected in, in various forms. I have it on the next animation. Um, copyright, patent, trademark, and trade secret. These are intellectual property. I'll define it here. It's creations of the mind. So this is like intangible property. It's not like real property or these objects that we see around us, but it's in the form of, let's say, artistic works like copyright that can be given a legal right, like in copyright law. Um, useful work such as patents, which uh, can include here in this example, the chemical composition of the tea or how it's made. Uh, it can include trademark, which is kind of brands and other things that you recognize uh, to identify the source of the good. And trade secrets, which are, for example, formulas that make the iced tea and companies like to come up with ways of keeping this uh, secret and they can generate legal rights. So these are different forms of intellectual property. You'll hear me refer to it as IP or again, intellectual property. And these are effectively like creations of the mind. Okay, next animation. I have a couple of charts. They may be a little bit hard to see in the back, but um, on the left chart, it's showing with time. So it's going from left to right with time showing that uh, more and more of the S&P 500 companies value in the US is based on intellectual property. It's a very high number now. Uh, this is based on a study that was done. So we're looking at something like, you know, about 90% of the value nowadays um, 
is based on uh, the, the top 500 companies on some form of intellectual property. And on the right side, it shows the sort of percentage or importance of intellectual property in various countries. And you'll see on the left side, um, the US is one of the leading ones and you have the UK. So these are sort of the Western nations where that are industrialized and they have intellectual property as a great part of their GDP and economy. And interestingly, you'll see the other two sort of highlighted um, countries are India and China that are becoming more and more industrialized and the largest you know, populations of the world. Uh, so with time, those countries, that is India and China, are recognizing the importance of IP. Some of the uh, Muslim countries are yet to recognize it, but as you'll see in a few slides, it is more and more important to certain Muslim countries. Okay, um, next slide 12. So I'll go over a very brief overview of Islamic law as it's called. Um, we think about this um, conceptualized in two uh, sort of primary sources of law uh, that we have, and then also secondary sources of law. So that's what I have in this um, diagram. And what I'm working on is the human understanding or the um, human understanding of the divine fiqh or solo fiqh, which is jurisprudence. And so we're looking at how can we apply divine sources of law to uh, human reason? And how can humans construe this, especially for new and novel issues, which is what uh, this is about. So some of the other issues you may have heard of um, go into environmental issues, um, different and new foods and things of that nature. I'm focused on intellectual property. Okay, next slide, uh, 13. So Islamic law is kind of complicated. I mentioned in, you see it in green, the two primary sources of law are Quran and Sunnah and on the blue are what we call secondary sources of law. So there's various forms, including scholarly consensus, analogical reasoning, um, various other principles like necessity or custom or equity. So there's complexity. That's one of the things to point out is there's complexity in Islamic law and uh, there's different ways that are reasoned when you have new situations arise. Okay, um, next slide, 14. So I'm focused on a research question looking at what is property? How do we think about property in um, Islam? Uh, there's many sources uh, or many references in our primary sources about property. And I'm interested in understanding whether intellectual property, what I had mentioned earlier about creations of the mind, can be permissible property. And inside of intellectual property, I'm mostly focused on patent law. As a patent attorney, that's what's of uh, greatest interest to me. Um, and inside of patent law, I am interested in this debate, which is shown on the very bottom, of how we look at recognizing private property, that is things we can own, and the conflict or tension with others that in, in society, whether they can access um, various goods and services. So I'm looking at this debate, which is shown on the bottom, the debate between private property and distribution or access in society. Okay, all right, next slide, 15. So uh, here's kind of a conceptualization of how I think about this. On one end, the left side, we have in Islam recognizing and allowing for private property, allowing for commerce, that is business and transactions, and allowing for incentives, that is promoting um, things that would motivate commerce or business. On the right side, we have other concerns regarding fairness, that is issues such as distribution in society, accessing um, certain goods and services, and just how we think about the concept of um, justice. So I have this as an arrow because this is something we can tweak in society and any human uh, way of running society. In some countries, it's stronger on one side and other countries stronger on the other. And as a professor and a scholar, we kind of debate these topics and try to balance this and drive policy, including in other countries, such as Muslim countries. Okay, next slide, please, 16. Okay, so what I am interested in is a theoretical debate. And I'll try to like give some examples because I know I've been talking a little bit abstractly so on uh, the next animation I have here is commerce, economics, and markets. And um, in one end of the spectrum, that is the 
left side that I showed on the prior side, um, we have some ways that we can motivate um, creative, inventive type activities. And these are various theories that um, I study and other people study here. Uh, one is creating some sort of incentive or reward system. And I'll go through this, but let me give maybe a um, some concrete way for this to make sense. Let's talk about the COVID vaccine. And this is the first time I think this, uh, this group here is back in this church since COVID started, right, in person, or maybe there's been a few things since then, but here we have our, at least our first talk here with COVID. Um, there was a debate on the COVID vaccine from various different angles. And the angle that people in my field studied was what was called as um, COVID waivers. So if you consider the big companies, anybody you know the big companies that have developed the COVID vaccine, what who they are? Pfizer. Pfizer. You know, Moderna, you have these big companies, right? There's only a handful of them. What is the objective of Pfizer and Moderna? I mean, what is it that they're in it for? They're, they're, they're in it for money, right? And um, so they're pharmaceutical companies that are in it for money and uh, they return value to their shareholders. Uh, but the other side of the debate for COVID was a international emergency, right? A public health figure. We were dependent on everything COVID, uh, everything that Pfizer and Moderna and others do. At the same time, they're in it for money, right? So uh, if we set up a society or a system, the question is, how should we motivate the Pfizer's and Moderna's of the world to develop solutions such as vaccines and all sorts of other healthcare solutions, especially when they're driven by money, versus what happens when we have a public health crisis especially what may be our next one, and how can we ensure that the masses have access to this vaccine? So this is kind of a, a concrete example of this debate on intellectual property, particularly patents, but I'll walk through this. So for example, the first sub bullet I have is a reward or an incentive. That is these big massive companies like Pfizer and Moderna and others they will only be interested in doing research and development for vaccines if there is some way for them to get a reward, right? So they'll spend a lot of money in R&D, but they want a reward. And they're going to spend, second bullet, uh, a lot of labor and effort, and they want to be recognized for that. Uh, we also want to promote competition in a society between Pfizer and Moderna and other companies. There's some good value in developing a pharmaceutical industry for that. Um, then there's also some value intellectual property for coordinating how various distribution mechanisms happen from research and development to getting this COVID vaccine to where many people were able to access it. Um, we also don't want there to be a uh, duplicative effort. So someone that's the first to come up with a vaccine solution would prevent the exact same effort from happening and wasting resources. And also, this um, intellectual property I'm talking about has some value to uh, raising funds, uh, so it has some value to investors and the like. But there's another side of the debate, and the next animation talks about some of the challenges with uh, intellectual property that's been discussed, that is access. So if we have a legal right with intellectual property that protects, let's say, the first party to come up with it, they can charge higher prices and not everyone can access it. Right? And this causes issues with access within a society as well as between developed countries and countries that are yet developing. So there's an issue of access and equity that we talk about. And there's a lot I can talk about in uh, papers in my field about this on imbalances with uh, racial imbalances. Uh, gender imbalances or marginalized communities. And there's also some other considerations such as, well, some societies like Islamic countries that have um, morality and ethical limitations, how they would look at issues related to biotechnology versus other countries that are like the US and the UK that are more free market driven and don't have morality restrictions. Okay, so that's the theoretical debate. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide. 17. And there's some animations here on slide 17, the next slide, um, that I'll just walk through real quickly. This is kind of like some concepts related to 
uh, property and some of the debates in Islamic law. So uh, in Islamic law, we, uh, as I show in this next animation, this like star figure that shows up, generally don't want there to be profit given without some sort of effort or labor. Okay, so that's one animation. I'll go on to the um, next animation on this slide, um, 17. Uh, okay, so besides profit without effort and labor, we also in Islamic law uh, try to prevent monopolistic type behaviors or hoarding of wealth, as you may have heard, right? Um, that is uh, something that is uh, should not happen. Next animation. Um, in the Hanafi school, one of the schools of, of jurisprudence, uh, there's this debate on whether property needs to be physically possessed versus the other madhabs um, uh, kind of have a more broad interpretation of uh, possession of property. Concealment of knowledge is also another thing. We in Islam uh, like there to be knowledge sharing uh, and not to restrict um, knowledge. Uh, and the next animation, indefiniteness in our contracts, we like to have there be definite terms and things such as uh, intellectual property. If uh, you know, I can talk more about it in Q and A. Uh, there's notions of indefinite, so there's some challenges with that. And then speculative risk. The next animation uh, you may know this from Islamic finance. We try to prevent um, this concept of uh, speculativeness or um, earning without some sort of labor again. So these are some of the tensions and theories and debates. Okay, I'll go on ethics as the last one. Um, ethics also, we have an ethical and morality sort of principle in Islam, and these are considerations. So these are some theories and debates in, in, in my work. And going on to the next slide, 18, and I'll have some nice um, animations in a moment. So this is like a just conceptual way of looking at the primary and secondary sources of Islamic law. And I left off last few slides ago about explaining the primary and secondary sources of law and talking about, excuse me, how I'm looking at this from a usul al fiqh standpoint. But I will point out here is there's differences between viewpoints on this. So certainly between Shia and Sunni, as well as Ibadi perspectives. And then in the uh, Sunni perspective, there's also differences between various madhabs. That's the Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi schools of jurisprudence. And even in the Shia'i uh, perspective, the Twelver, as well as Ismaili perspectives are different. So what I'm talking about may have different interpretations in different contexts. And they also have differences in various countries. I put three of them here that I'll quickly walk through for examples to show why they're important uh, to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and uh, Oman that have really started focusing on intellectual property. There's also a lot of interest in um, Southeast Asia, particularly in Indonesia and Malaysia. I don't cover those, but certainly those are also uh, countries where this is of importance. Okay, uh, next slide, uh, uh, 19. And so this is kind of maybe a little bit hard to tell in the back, but it's a chart showing um, basically countries and where they stack up on, on innovation. So think about high tech and innovative type activity. And the point here is that countries like Oman, Saudi Arabia, Qatar are uh, making efforts and embarking on initiatives to become more innovative. Okay. All right, now next slide, 20. So I have some just kind of like some images of sort of some of the things going on in these countries and why it's gotten a lot of attention, why intellectual property has gotten a lot of attention. So the short of it is as oil and gas becomes less of a um, resource for these mostly Arab uh, Peninsula countries, uh, their economies will have to change and Many of these countries, these Gulf states, have embarked on innovation incentive type programs to come up with new sources of uh, wealth and new economies as oil and gas becomes less dominant or as reserves dwindle. So Oman is a country uh, this as, uh, that has embarked on this initiative started by uh, the late uh, Sultan Qaboos. Um, there's other countries that I'll show next. Um, slide 21. Next slide, please. Qatar is one as well. You see um, Qatar has embarked on a lot of innovative things with its um, uh, 2030 vision. They also have a lot of um, U.S. universities that have set up operations there. A lot of sort of futuristic 
uh, visions, a very wealthy country, but one that will soon uh, be embarking in different sort of um, economies. Okay, um, next slide, please, 22. And uh, Saudi Arabia has been one. This is sort of uh, one that we, when we think about oil and gas, uh, they're certainly very dominant and they have made efforts to transform or starting to transform their economy with a grand uh, Vision 2030 plan. Okay, um, next slide, please. Uh, in fact, in Saudi Arabia, just recently, uh, as I was coming back from my trip overseas in December 2022, the Crown Prince uh, had made a major announcement that Saudi Arabia is going to embark on a very strong focus on intellectual property over the next five years. And so their economy is completely transforming. And why I'm interested in this is that there is some conflict with Islamic law and these principles. And that's what I'll talk about as I go further and kind of explain some of my proposals. So I will go into next slide 24. So I will show some photos to make this a little bit fun. Maybe you should have had this at the start to show some nice places I've gone to to present parts of this talk and um, research. So I had a chance to go to Malaysia. Um, as you may know, in Malaysia, this is the Petronas Tower. So oil and gas is a big part of their economy. They're really interested in this, obviously a very large um, Muslim population. So I had a chance to go to um, IIUM, it's an Islamic um, uh, university, and uh, with a bunch of other professors and uh, students present uh, work in this. And it was um, really fun and got to do some site saving, uh, including Batu Caves and other uh, places I went to, but a really lovely uh, trip and to talk to a lot of the people involved with policymaking and economists in the country. Okay, um, next slide, 25. Uh, so this past December, through my funding that I mentioned from George Mason, I got to go to five countries, starting with the UK. Uh, UK, the reason I went there is there's actually really great scholars in Islamic law. Many of them are actually not Muslim, but a rich uh, background of Islamic finance. Many banks and institutions that are in the um, Arab Peninsula. Uh, have offices in the UK, and there's great um, professors and scholars and researchers in the UK. So I got a chance to um, meet with several uh, that do what I call comparative law work and are experts in Islamic finance, for example. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then I went to Turkey, and um, I went to uh, a school there where one of the leading professors in Islamic economics uh, is at um, IZU, uh, just outside of Istanbul, and had a great conversation to learn about a lot of the theories and other things that uh, I mentioned earlier. And so I also got to do some great um, sightseeing while I was in Turkey. Uh, this is also of great importance to Turkey, uh, particularly as some of their schools are kind of setting up uh, technology transfer and um, sort of engineering departments to work on things that could be patented. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, Jordan is where I spent the most time. I had some lovely uh, sightseeing uh, in Petra and I went to Amman and uh, Mount Nebo and Madhaba and uh, Dead Sea and some great uh, tourism, but I also got to get some work done. And I'll show kind of the, one of the main things I learned in uh, the next slide. Uh, in Jordan, which is slide 28, and next, uh, th this is where I learned a lot of stuff, which was going to um, Jordan University of Science and Technology, um, just as well as Yarmouk uh, University, uh, which is the middle top photo of where the um, there's an Islamic studies department at Yarmouk. And uh, so I went to Yarmouk and uh, just in the city of Irbid in Jordan and met with some um, of the leading uh, professors in this field and ended up getting some collaborative efforts going for uh, biomedical and pharmaceutical ethics and how that fits into the Islamic ethics world. Okay, um, next slide, 29. Okay, this was kind of my main thing I wanted to point out. It's a little bit hard to see, but I had a great conversation with um, Arabic speaking professor through a translator to try to understand uh, how we could think about intellectual property. And my Arabic is not that great. So this is something I'm hoping to work on. So I worked with a translator and professor uh, that I met with there, uh, this is Professor Omar uh, that I met with and he explained how Islamic law uh, would construe intellectual property. And he sort of, his English is not that great. My Arabic is not that great. 
And so he was able to work with a translator and wrote up this form. And basically he, he says that um, intellectual property is and should be recognized in, as an expert in Sulafik and also as a member of um, kind of a senior person at an advisory board, Sharia advisory board from uh, leading bank. He, he kind of wrote an opinion on this. So it was great for me to learn about this. Okay, um, next slide, 30. <clears throat> I also got to go to Kuwait. Kuwait is one of these um, sort of oil rich countries and uh, they have a lot of innovative type activities happening through the government at an institution that does applied um, chemical uh, and environmental type research called KISSER, uh, Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research. So I got a nice tour of um, KISSER and saw all the great things their scientists and engineers are doing and mathematicians and so on. And um, so that's also of importance to Kuwait. And uh, they have a law school there that uh, this next slide on um, slide 31 is uh, images from their, their law school. Uh, so I, I met some uh, faculty there that look at a lot of the legal concepts that uh, I got a chance to learn about. Okay, uh, and then Kuwait has some great sites too, some just amazing uh, structure. So um, just a beautiful country, my first time there. and. Uh, really fun to check out. Okay, um, next slide. And then UAE is probably the most important and most relevant to some of the things I'm working on. So this is in Dubai and uh, you see this image of construction and why this is uh, important is Dubai is trying to set up a zone, a, a sort of an area that will have different laws than other parts of the country. And the idea is to have these laws be kind of like a free market and promote innovation and innovative activity. So this is a building that I went on a tour of that's going to be a digital technology, a startup hub, and an innovation hub um, that is starting. And they're trying to figure out, well, what sort of law should we have? And the potential project I have is how can there be a Sharia compliance to investments that uh, essentially several wealthy families are invest interested in investing in? So the most analogous thing I can think of is in Islamic finance, you can get here a Sharia compliant mortgage, for example. Um, it's a product that's accessible to the masses now, but it took decades for scholars and others to come up with ways to um, have what's called a mortgage in the US and UK and other Western countries, but is considered Sharia compliant. And here I ask if anybody has one, but um, I don't know if I should, maybe a personal question, but I have looked at these myself and they're almost similar to what a you know non-Sharia compliant mortgage would be. Um, there's some differences legally uh, to it, but it's a product that's very much accessible. By comparison here, uh, there's several wealthy families and really the government in the UAE that wants to invest in technological companies, but they want to know if it's essentially Sharia compliant or fulfills Islamic principles. So, for example, things dealing with my field of intellectual property, how can they be assured that it fits within Islamic principles? So there's a compliance project that may come out of this effort. OK, um, next slide. Uh, and yeah, I got to do some great um, sightseeing uh, around uh, the UAE, uh, including the top left University of Sarja, which is quite interesting to um, go from, if anyone's been in the UAE, it's completely different where, where how Dubai is, and just going a few miles or kilometers further to Sarja, very different from a um, view of uh, Islam, I guess, and how it's practiced, very different, one being Dubai much more liberal and uh, Sarja being much more conservative, but just separated by a few miles or kilometers. Okay, um, next slide. So I, I got to see a lot of cool things. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about the kind of relevant, very briefly framework and then open it up to Q&A and get a couple of proposals. So how do I look at this like really, um, I think, important question that has application to many countries that is something that questions are dealing with intellectual property? How can it be recognized within Islamic law? Uh, what can Islamic law um, provide to uh, the U.S. and other countries about what intellectual property should be? And then how can there be Sharia compliant intellectual property? 
Um, those are kind of things I'm looking at. So I'll just briefly mention a couple of frameworks, particularly those that you know may be interested in Islamic law. One is Makasa al Sharia, and then just sort of an ethical legal lens. Okay, so these are some frameworks that I look at. Uh, one, the next slide, uh, 36, is a bit hard to see, a bit complicated, but uh, very briefly, it's a modern interpretation of Sharia. Uh, it is considered more. Uh, it's a little bit controversial, but it's based on some writings of uh, Al Ghazali in terms of uh, basic principles that the Sharia should serve to achieve. And there were sort of five pillars that were reflected in that. And, and I'll kind of very briefly sort of mention those, but um, based on it, it's um, protection of religion, protection of life, protection of mind, protection of wealth and protection of family, and the sort of broad principles that are construed every time there's a new situation. So situations such as intellectual property that I'm talking about, other situations such as environmental preservation or socially responsible corporate governance. Uh, and the question is, can we stretch how we think about Sharia uh, or can it be construed in a more modern context? So this is a bit controversial, there are some people that will take a very strict sort of originalist perspective and others that will take a more modern perspective. And uh, this has generated a lot of debate, but this is a lens that um, I'm interested in kind of investigating and uh, looking at uh, more. Okay, next slide, please. And then um, ethics and law. There's always debates between how we think about ethics and law. Broadly uh, speaking here uh, is this concept in Islamic uh, jurisprudence of there being a moral foundation or having some sort of um, underlying ethical code as we look at novel situations versus here in the US or UK, uh, there is some, uh, I mean, this is largely a Judeo-Christian type um, legal system, or at least the basis of it is, but we have much more of a, of a free market. But in other societies, like in Muslim societies, in theory, there should be an underlying ethical or moral moral code. So this is another lens that uh, I'm looking at as I go through my research. All right, last thing, and I'll wrap up. I know I've been talking for a while and kind of want to open it up for questions or just discussion is, you know, why should we care? Uh, who should care about this and, and what should be done? So this is kind of the payoff uh, part of the research. I've kept it kind of brief because I wanted to go through all the overview of it. And I will add, uh, as far as you know, who should care about this? My primary audience is mostly uh, professors. So let's see, I'm on slide um, 38 here. Uh, next slide, and it's it's really uh, professors and policymakers, um, professors in law and economics, uh, maybe political science, um, and those sort of disciplines, and also international relations, international trade, uh, and then also policymakers, particularly in these countries that I went in toward uh, to sort of drive policy that would help create innovation. And then those in practice that would implement some of these laws, particularly attorneys, uh, maybe physicians and pharmacists and others as well. So those are, I think, who would who would care. Uh, there's two things that I'm like interested in as far as proposals, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and I'll just wrap up and take it uh, to sort of questions. Okay, uh, next slide, 39. So it's a little bit hard to see, but um, I talked a little bit about Makassad. Uh, this is Makassad al-Sharia, sort of let's think about it as a modern sort of principle-driven interpretation of Sharia. And on the left and on the right is a finance equivalent uh, work that's done by professors looking at the banking industry. And they've come up with a sort of index to see how close are certain banks to being uh, performing within Makassid principles. And so this is something I think I can apply to intellectual property, the same sort of uh, metrics and analysis and sort of economics and uh, math can be done to coming up with a index. It's sort of like you may have seen in the corporate context here, when you see corporations, there's an index or of how socially responsible they are, for example. Uh, if you invest in certain companies, you'll see a sort of index on how environmentally conscious they are. It's kind of like that. So I'm kind of coming up with an index uh, similar to what economists and Islamic finance professors have done, 
re related to how um, much certain banks and financial institutions follow Islamic principles and how much they may deviate from. It. Okay, uh, next um, slide. Uh, and then the ethics lens to it, particularly here uh, uh, in some of the trips I went in Jordan, uh, for example, looking at pharmaceutical, biotechnological research, uh, coming up with uh, some sort of sh uh, Sharia uh, compliant metric. Uh, and that's another thing that I'm working on, some sort of framework or metric on how we can look at particularly innovations uh, dealing with stem cells, tissue engineering, and other sort of new and novel, innovative type uh, healthcare and biotechnological uh, type uh, innovations. I'll skip the law part on this, but I can talk about more of this um, later. Okay, so that's slide 40. And let me just give some key takeaways as I wrap up. I'm on slide 41. And um, uh, here are some key takeaways. So if you, you know, um, just want sort of an overview of this talk, number one, um, one of the things I'm interested in is sort of motivating for my project is that Islamic law can be a, a sort of new lens for how we think about intellectual property within the Islamic context. So uh, that is one thing, right? Um, a lot of these countries do have intellectual property laws. I should have probably started off talking about this, that they have it in many countries. But the question is, are they actually Islamically uh, compliant? And uh, in my research, uh, I show that, well, Islamic law itself can be a new lens for how these laws are in different countries. Number two, the next animation, uh, there is some importance and relevance to Muslim majority countries. That is, they need to balance their economic justifications and recognizing of commerce and developing their countries, as well as sort of distribution and access issues and um, you know, having sort of a more equal playing field inside these countries, as well as degrees of difference between interpretive, interpretive Islamic law in these countries. For example, um, the madhab difference between these countries, as well as the degree of primacy of Sharia in these countries. For example, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Islamic law Sharia is everything. There is no exception. Versus in other countries, there's a degree of difference of it. Okay, and then um, last animation here. Uh, I think there's something here that um, the U.S. and so-called Western countries like the U.K. and uh, U.S. can learn from the Islamic perspective. I think there's some inequities we have in um, in the U.S. We have imbalances, particularly from intellectual property and other sort of vantage points to help balance this could be helpful. Okay. Um, last slide, uh, I saw this today, uh, actually my dad sent me this. So when we're talking about innovative activity and where this is innovative, you may have seen this uh, video going around. It is this, uh, it can be for hand those handicapped and those uh, you know, going to uh, prayer halls and struggling with either not, they're not being a chair or how to um, you know, sit and pray. So there is this thing that's been floating around of this floatable, uh, foldable chair that comes out of the ground and helps those the elderly and handicapped uh, still observe prayers. And so as it relates, you know, it's some sort of uh, innovative type thing. I've got a link to a video that shows this. This is coming from Qatar. And um, you know, sort of how this can be applied in a patent context may be something to sort of think about. So. Um, you know, innovation exists in many contexts, including in Islamic uh, context and in Muslim countries. So I know I went into a lot of um, depth and I'll just go to the next slide to say um, that's my uh, title slide on slide 43. Happy to take questions and don't want to be too long, long because I know people are going to be looking to break their fast too, but uh, I would be interested in taking questions or uh, re-explaining anything or um, welcome your comments as well as far as what to explore. Yeah, um, so yes, you said you uh, talked about uh, pluralism, which mm -hmm. my yep. mind is kind of a, a fuzzy way, uh, a way to organize uh, society or government. Right. And that got me to thinking that uh, America was founded as a republic. So I was curious, like, how those two things, republicanism and sure. pluralism, relate to each other. And, uh, yeah. yeah, great question. I kind of got away from that, but I started off talking about it, which was right. about pluralism. And um, 
the concept here, again, you're right, you have sort of multi perspectives in it. And one of the things I look at in this paper is the Islamic perspective has this pluralism and in the property and intellectual property realm, that pluralism is both recognizing commerce and profit and um, exchange of goods and services and having incentives and allowing uh, Muslims and those in society to make money. And on the other side, also recognizing that we should try to balance things when there's inequity. So this is kind of the basis of my paper. In the U.S., while there is some pluralistic viewpoints, at least in my field of intellectual property, it's very much here a stronger commercial and law and economics driven um, context. So we don't have many of these mechanisms to balance inequity. So uh, as it applies here in the U.S. to your question uh, and in the context of patents, which is what I focus on, the, there's tremendous inequities and imbalances that a lot of people have written about. For example, the largest 10 companies, uh, the largest 10 patent holders are 10 companies, right? They, I mean, they have the greatest number of patents and it seems imbalanced relative to say startups, smaller companies and universities. So you have a tremendous hoarding, so to speak, of patents amongst the largest companies. These are like the Microsofts of the world um, also the Pfizer's, those sort of companies. Uh, there's also tremendous um, inequities and imbalances between racial type uh, uh, sort of patenting behavior. So there's a lot written that a large number of inventors that uh, in the U.S. tend to be white or of some Asian background. Uh, so it is um, really imbalanced. Also gender, there's a much larger male patenting activity than female. And so we see these imbalances and what a pluralistic view would look at is try to balance this more, uh, as well as come up with mechanisms to redistribute um, where there may be inequities, right? So for example, pricing of pharmaceuticals, especially those that may be buying you know, certain drugs here, uh, those that are not generic ones, if you're getting the sort of, um, you know, name brand drugs, they're, you're going to pay higher prices, but not any, but not everybody can access that. So the question is, how can we redistribute this to have more equal access to higher priced uh, pharmaceuticals? Yeah. Right. Just to follow up on it, yes. to my simple, you know, uh, minded way of thinking mm -hmm. is that this, this, uh, um, mechanism of redistribution, I see that as the God, right? Yes. Is that it? Yeah, okay. Right. I didn't go so much into it because of the depth of this. I want to go into overview. So we wouldn't have this uh, uh, in in a complete market-based system like our intellectual property system. There is some ways government gets in to help redistribute. But in from an Islamic standpoint, mechanisms such as zakat or you have other sort of religious-based mechanisms, for example, the um, um, the Mormon community, for example, has mechanisms. There's other ones that are religiously driven where they'll redistribute amongst their society. So one of the proposals I have that I'm working on in my paper is how could we have redistribution of intellectual property so that we don't have a Muslim society where um, you have this monopolistic type effect, such as with the Microsofts and Pfizer's of the world, as these Muslim countries are you know, creating the new sort of technology companies or uh, manufacturing companies, how there can be this distribution. And the short of it is in those countries, in the Muslim countries, government has a more proactive role. They're going to try to set pricing and government comes in. And, um, you know, there's some challenges with that as well. And we don't have this really in the U.S. as much. But uh, the view is that in Muslim countries, you would have more of that. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. For People like me that may not know that. What is Madhab? Oh, yeah, sorry. I kind of went a lot into it. So that's a school of jurisprudence. And uh, it, Madhab is there's um, different schools of um, jurisprudence or uh, different ways of looking at law in Islam. And um, in a Sunni perspective, there's four Madhabs. And there's based uh, on some, let's say, uh, certain differences, but they're not so significant where there's any sort of deviation from 
the major Islamic principles, but there are certain differences on practices and observations, and it's traced based on um, a sort of uh, sort of a following in some ways. And so it's a school of jurisprudence. There's uh, one can accept one or the other, or take it in part one way or the other. And there's differences of opinion um, on legal concepts in these manhubs, in the Sunni perspective, in the Shiite perspective. There's also uh, some differences there, as well as in the Ibadi perspective. So there's different ways of looking at the fundamental. Well, while the fundamentals of Islam are the same, there's some minute differences. Um, and we have schools of jurisprudence or scholars that sort of explain what those differences are. Yes. I, I appreciate the like very idealistic view of like trying to create this idea of like intellectual property in the Middle East. Right. Where do you find you have the most pushback? Um, would you be more clear in like what has really set you back in like, making this happen? Yeah. Um. Okay. So, uh, I will. I, I should give some background. It's in some of my papers, but there isn't been that much pushback. What's really happened is a lot of these countries, because of international treaties and pressures, have gone along with largely U.S. Uh, U.K. driven intellectual property law. So they've adopted the equivalents in those countries. Uh, but what I argue is that doesn't necessarily mean it fits within. Um, Islamic law or religious perspectives in these countries relative to the free markets like the U.S. and others. So there's a view of um, there isn't that much pushback. And I'm actually saying there may need to be pushback because there's differences. So, for example, uh, in biology and biotechnology, we can hear uh, in the U.S. get pants over what may be morally not appropriate in Islamic perspectives. Okay, so that is where there could be pushback. Um, also, from a um, uh, morality standpoint, in the U.S., we don't have a restriction. One can get patents, for example, on weapons and destructive things that could be considered morally wrong in other societies. And so, I would say there should be some pushback on that. Uh, but as far as what's happening in these countries. Uh, they are trying to enact these laws and um, they are new to it. And they've kind of gone along with what has been negotiated at sort of the international treaty level. Uh, that's the sort of phenomena that's going on. Also, like in another area of law, which is not my primary area, um, there are already some pushback, like you, like you mentioned, that there may need to be a change. So I'll give you an idea in the corporate law context, um, the concept of what's called preferred rights doesn't really exist that much in Muslim countries, but it's needed. Um, preferred rights are basically special rights that investments uh, investors have or investment firms have, and they have stronger rights when they try to sell a business, for example. There isn't really that concept yet. It's starting to change. And really to have a sort of investment-rich um, effort happening in these countries, there would need to be preferred rights into startups for investors to get really interested. So there has been some pushback already in restrictions in the corporate law context, but um, I think that will need to be lessened for there to be innovative activity in these countries. But there's different branches of law that have different kind of things going on. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I always had the assumption that this supposedly a more subversive. Right. Is that really the case? Are you talking about the intellectual property? And there's some new restrictions to that country. So you can have certain companies and financial motive. Sure. Certain motivation back. And yeah. Like, what's the motive behind the opposition? Is that great? Um. So this is a great question on Makasa and sort of. What's the receptivity to it and how does it relate to intellectual property? This is what I'm working on in part in this paper. So yes, it is a more sort of progressive principle driven uh, view on what Sharia should be. And I'm using it as a lens because intellectual property is a novel issue. Now, um, some Sharia boards have said that intellectual property is recognized as a form of property. I accept that and that's in some papers, but there's so many levels of different issues in my field I can go into that, for example, just 
patenting of stem cells or CRISPR or looking at um, very novel and sort of unique biotechnological things. Um, these are things that require a sort of more modern interpretive type of lens. So I'll give you an analogy in sort of the medicine context. Um, uh, there's There's been some debate before on, um, for example, women that go to see a physician, whether they should be treated by a female physician versus a male physician, right? So there was debate about that. And in cases of um, sort of legal reasoning into this, they looked at necessity and other legal principles in some cases to permit that, but there may be those that are very strict that would argue against that. Um, in the medicine context, cadavers, for example, um, and, and sort of experimenting on them, um, there's medical research benefit. I'm not a physician or medical researcher, but there's some benefits to that. And so how the law looks at this for sort of the greater good um, is important. And there's also debate whether this is already captured in uh, a principle called maslaha, which is public interest, and whether this is also distinct, because it is distinct or not. And um, the short of it is, is that more progressive uh, scholars will utilize Mukasid and recognize it for a greater sort of public good and modern interpretive type principles. A few of the things I've mentioned, uh, as well as like women's rights and other papers have been written on this, right? So um, it's sort of a, a more principle driven, uh, modern interpretive type uh, analysis. There's some controversy, which is what I want to address in intellectual property and use that as a mechanism. Yeah, you know, this is where I hope to get some more trips so I can go places and check out things too, because I'm I'm an American, I'm here. Um, and uh, yes, at least in my travels, I saw uh, some openness. I've gone to a few countries and, and seen the differences uh, between it. Um, and so it's just some of it's culturally driven differences in laws, uh, a little bit about just, uh, you know, how they operate. So I saw significant differences, for example, in, you know, Turkey versus Kuwait, uh, and also I'm sure Saudi Arabia versus um, the UAE, there's differences. In, in fact, as I was mentioning, inside the UAE, you have different emirates um, there. Uh, where Dubai is compared to where Sarja is, there's like a significant difference between just how practices are and viewpoints on things. Yes. Yeah. So the question, um, uh, people can hear it on Zoom, is. Uh, we have a patent office here in the US and we also have it in many Western countries. Uh, can in these other countries, can they file patents? And the short answer is yes. Uh, and I have this on one of the slides, um, but uh, in a backup slide, I think. Uh, the GCC, it's for the Gulf countries. There's a regional office, it's in Saudi Arabia. So all of the Gulf countries, if you're looking to file patents in protection in the Gulf, you would file it with that office. And so they do exist. It is fairly primitive there. So that's one of the things that I'm hoping to develop. Uh, it is quite primitive. And um, a lot of the countries there are just starting to develop patent systems. In fact, my old law firm work with um, a lot of clients in these countries. And one of the things we observed is they would file a lot more U.S. patents, even though they are based in these other countries. The reason is that they would want to have um, you know, sales and distribution and um, grow internationally. So one of the challenges these countries are trying to do, these are the Arab Peninsula countries, is they want to strengthen their patent systems so that they can help incentivize innovation. And that is part of my research is looking at how that can be done and what are some of the Islamic law restrictions to it and how can there be also Sharia compliance in these countries, yeah. Please, yes. Is there any fear that IP laws that cause Islamic law, or is it like a good job to based on principles and sure, that's a great question. The question's about are there IP specific laws that come out of Islamic law? That's a great question. So it actually is really something you know scholars would look at as 
really thinking about what is intellectual property or what should it be. And it's largely a sort of Western concept. It's come out of the Venetian Republic, which is based in where we think about Italy. Um, and it's been developed really through a system that was in Western Europe and the US. And it's gone to other countries. So the way we think about intellectual property, even the word, the phrase, the notion, the legal principles is very much a so-called Western construct. But what I'm looking at in this paper is, well, there may be another perspective. And if you're interested, um, there's this free uh, conference with George Mason University where I have an affiliation at the end of April that will also talk about these perspectives. And so one of the viewpoints I'll bring is that intellectual property can be what it is, but there can be some balancing. There can be ways of removing excesses. And that would be what I argue is the Islamic perspective. What's interesting, some of my colleagues on that panel, um, including one from a Hindu perspective, one from a Buddhist perspective, I think we may have someone from a Christian perspective talking about this as well. And so they're looking at it from their religious sources and answering that question, whether it exists or in some cases should not exist at all. And so it's really interesting, I think, from looking at it from different lenses, different religions, different cultures, but largely the way we think about intellectual property is really more of a Western construct here. Right. Then you kind of put an intellectual property barrier on there. I don't know, interesting. It's a, definitely a Western concept. That's how I see it. It's interesting to see how it will be. Right. So it's a great question. So the question is about um, uh, how, uh, sort of about like what Islam's brought to the West and how it can reframe this construct of intellectual property. The reason I think this is exciting is that, particularly in this legal academic world, there isn't a lot coming out of these countries. These are in the Arab Peninsula, Southeast Asia, North Africa. But I think I want to help develop that and, and bridge this gap that exists. Uh, by comparison, for example, between the US and China, there's a lot of discussion, um, lots happening there. So I do think there's this opportunity from the Muslim world, from these countries to influence a lot. And that voice needs to be had. And hopefully there will be some funding for me to explore this and uh, have more of this. And there are a lot of people in these countries that um, would like to have a voice at this table. And I think that's something we can bring. I want to be careful of time. I'm not sure where we're at on time. Um, two minutes. OK, I guess we can do a couple more questions. Sure. I had a question. So you touched on the uh, very problematic nature of clothing. Right. And the well-placed, you know, very well-placed you know, desire to offset the ill effects. So, so I got thinking to this and uh, maybe some that I've shared very little sure, sure, sure. memory is that uh, wherever there is any good to be found, that is the property of the moment or a believer. Correct. So to my mind, you know, way of thinking, uh, IP, at least as it's practiced here in the US, right. is um, almost a way of holding, right? Because you yep. have to keep it so. So yeah. So yeah. Okay. So the questions about hoarding and how we think about it in the Western U.S. perspective versus what it may be in the Islamic perspective. So I'll close with this thought, which I had with uh, the professor at Yarmouk University, leading kind of scholar on Islamic, um, uh, you know, law, and um, uh, Professor Osama that was there at Yarmouk. He gave me this concept. So uh, there's, and I don't know the exact, and I'm more of a patent person. I'm an American. I'm coming from a U.S. perspective, so I may not give it the um, sort of formalities that I should in this, but there is in Islamic perspective these um, this one. Um, I think it's uh, there's a hadith, or there, there may be something that I, I should know, and I have this written down from talking to Professor Osama. But there's this recognition that there's a party that had land, and they're saying I should be able to water my land. And there was a drought in this area. And then there's other people that could not water their, their land, right? They were not doing, uh, able to keep up their farm. And so the question is, should one party be able to benefit from the river that goes closest to their land and water it? And in, in a way, hoard, right? Uh, they're basically, they have this fence and they're saying, I've got this fence, I can water this. And the Islamic perspective is there can be also what's called an easement we have here as well. Um, or a public necessity or public need so that the other party can also have that water to farm uh, for their farm. 
So this is actually the tension that I'm focused on in really understanding when we can have that easement as well as how we should think about it, not so much in the real property context, but the intellectual property. But yes, in the US, it's really, it's mine uh, is our way of looking at it, but maybe it's different in other contexts. So anyways, um, I will kind of pause and first thank everybody because we got a minute. So I wanted to really thank everybody for listening. I know this is complex and happy to take questions or talk offline. You can also email me. Uh, I've got my faculty website link uh, that, that you saw here. Um, and I want to thank Muslim Space and all the organizers for their uh, many efforts in getting this uh, up and running. So I wanted to thank everyone for this and en enjoy the talk. questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks.